I feel it's a very important topic uh, for us to be studying uh, how to understand your Bible. A lot of people want to learn more from their Bible. They get frustrated from trying to study Scripture. They, they get bogged down in the fact that they, they, they get into it, they start reading it, but they don't really have any other principle guiding them, and they just kind of get done. And so they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. And so I want to be able over the next three weeks share with you, I think, uh, general guiding principles and some really special specific principles that I think are really going to help you. And uh, the, the first part of this study tonight is going to be a lot of, of uh, motivation. The second part uh, is going to be more nuts and bolts. And then the second and third lesson are going to be really nuts and bolts. And uh, we're going to get into some stuff. But I want to stress as we begin tonight the principle of personal Bible study. It's really important for you, if you want to get more out of God's Word, to commit to studying the Bible. That's not just reading the Bible. I'm talking about actually studying the Bible. God has given to us His Word, and it is a treasure. It is a wonderful gift for us. But we, to be able to learn from it, to be able to obey it, to be able to understand it, it is impossible to do if our Bibles are not studied. And if they remain closed or hidden away, and if we don't understand what it says. And so the way that uh, that is accomplished is more than just us on our own. There's more than just that. I want to talk to you tonight about human teachers. Because the Bible says very clearly that God gives some people the gift and the ministry of teaching His Word. You know, I've given you some scriptures there, and I've, in fact, in all the lessons, you'll have the scriptures on your handout to be able to, to follow along with what we're doing. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, and in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, those speaking in different kinds of tongues. So some people are given this particular gift. Not everybody is given this gift, but some people are given the gift to be able to impart God's word through teaching. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 13, it was he, God, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We need to listen to and we need to learn from those that God puts in front of us who are teaching us His Word. But we need to also verify their teaching like the Bereans did in the book of Acts. Acts 17, 11, I gave you that verse. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. See, I think, in particular, young Christians need to be consulting older Christians who actually have an understanding and a foundation in the Word of God, especially if they believe that they've been reading through and they've discovered something that's new, some kind of a new teaching or new insight. If someone studied a portion of the Bible and they, they think, I've got some new truth, well, they need to take that idea to somebody who actually really does understand the Word of God, a more mature believer, because new ideas are not always right ideas, even those that come through prayerful study, believe it or not. So there are human teachers, but also there is the teaching of the Holy Spirit. God uses human teachers. God uses our own prayerful study, but we cannot expect to understand God's Word by just that alone. God, the Holy Spirit, has got to be our teacher. Look at the verses that I've laid out for you there. John 16, verse 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. 
And then John 14, verse 26, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. God has promised to guide us so that we know what his word means. And one of the main things the Holy Spirit has come to do is to actually illuminate the scriptures. And if we recognize his teaching ministry, we will be, we will be stirred to be able to dig more into the Bible to want to learn and want to grow. And this is going to help us from putting too much confidence in my own study, in my own knowledge, in my own learning. We, we won't get to a place where we think that our minds can grasp biblical truth unaided or that our hard study gives us special and expert knowledge or that we, what we know of the Bible is the final say. We will actually have a humble spirit thanking God for all that we do know but recognizing there is still a whole bunch more that we have to learn. So that leads into the thought of having an adequate but not perfect understanding of the Word of God. Saying that we can understand God's Word does not mean that we can understand everything in God's Word, solve all of the problems of interpretation, get all of the answers to all of the questions that people have. Some passages in the Bible are just incredibly difficult to understand regardless of how learned you may or may not be. For instance, I've given you one verse just to mess with you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are, the, why are people baptized for them? What do you do with that? What does that mean? Now, that verse, by the way, has a, a, several schools of thought, many different interpretations. Mormons actually practice a baptism for the dead. They baptize people on behalf of people who have already died. Is that the proper interpretation of that verse? So God encourages us to read his word, to study his word, promising that he will enable us to be able to understand it and to fellowship with him in its light. But he does not tell us that knowledge is going to come to us super easy. Sometimes there are going to be passages, verses that we study that will be hard. I'm not going to settle this verse, by the way, right here and now. We'll just leave that hanging. Um, so let's, let's deal with this. Who can understand the Bible? Not everyone can properly interpret the Bible. The main truth of the Bible is, spirit, is, is spiritual, so only spiritually qualified people can actually understand what it says. God's Word is for people who can and will listen to its Word. Every true Christian already has some of the necessary qualifications for understanding God's Word. Others you may acquire, but without them, you have no chance of actually knowing what the Bible says properly. So here are the qualities. Write these down as we go through this. The first is having a new heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The interpreter must be born again, period. The Bible message concerns God and man and how they relate. Therefore, one who stands outside of that relationship will miss much of what God has actually said. He may be able to accumulate facts and, and some evidence or comprehend te technical points of language, but the man who has not actually received spiritual life from God lacks an essential qualification for understanding the message of God. Second, he needs to have a hungry heart. 
1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Bible knowledge does not come through just casual interest and occasional reading. It's not like pretty colored shells lying on the seashore. Bev and Terry love to collect shells and they go and do that all the time and we got into it when we were down in Florida. But you know, you can go and do that and see the ones that you like and they're pretty and colorful and you pick those up. That's not Bible study. Bible study, I think, is more, it's not like going and finding a pretty colored shell. It's more like finding precious ore in a mine. You can only find it if you are actually determined to find it. You have to desire. You have to be hungry for it. You need a hungry heart. Third, you need an obedient heart. Psalm 119 verses 98 through 100 says, your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. To understand the Bible, we must be willing to obey what God shows us of his will. The Bible calls for response, not just analysis. And if we are unwilling to act, we cannot reach the full truth of his word. Learning and obedience actually go hand in hand. If God teaches me something and then I obey, then I can expect God to teach me some more. If I refuse to obey, then I can expect to stay right where I'm at in the knowledge that I have until I learn what it is that God is wanting me to get. And when I learn it, then I'll be able to learn more. Without obedience, further steps in knowing God's word are impossible. So you need an obedient heart. Fourth, you need a disciplined heart. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. A person with a disciplined heart will start something, and then they will keep on doing it. Even though it's hard at times, he will be cutting out certain things out of his life for the sake of a higher priority. The discipline must be self-discipline. No one else can compel a man to actually study the Word. At times, we will find Bible study very interesting, even thrilling, but not always. Only through discipline will we understand that the goal is not reached quickly, it's not reached easily, Jesus said, seek and you will find. Not, you will find by chance or casual looking. Also, we need a teachable heart. Isaiah 50 verse 4, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The teachable heart wants to learn and wants to go on learning. It never thinks it's learned enough. In fact, the more it learns, the more it realizes it does not know. The teachable heart realizes that it needs to learn from others as well. Most are willing to learn from God, but being willing to be taught by another brother or sister, especially when you are in the wrong, that is another matter entirely. The humble and teachable heart is the one to whom God will reveal his truth. So let's move on to the next section, the importance of having a proper understanding. Bible students have thought and studied and written a great deal about how it is to interpret the Bible. Many verses are not clear to us. We read them and we reread them and we still seem to be puzzled by them. We can see two, maybe even more possible meanings in a particular verse. Sometimes a verse is so puzzling, we can't even see one possible meaning. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 
Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, what does that verse mean? A yoke is a wooden bar that is laid across the necks of two draft animals like oxen. And it links them together to do work out in the field, like pulling a plow. So does that verse mean that a believer should not get under a wooden bar next to a non-believer? Is that what that verse means? Does it refer to marriage of a believer and a non-believer? Does it forbid Christians from joining groups like the Masons or, or Rotary? What is the yoke referring to? How can we actually find out? By the way, everything I just mentioned are different ways that people interpret those verses. Psalm 115, verse 17. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. What does that verse mean? Don't Christians worship God after they die? See, what I'm, what I'm trying to point out is there are passages that you can read that can be perplexing, that can bring up questions that need to be answered. At least, hopefully, you want them to be answered. So it's really important then that you have correct principles as you interpret Scripture to, to, to go through it. To interpret the Bible correctly, we must we must use correct principles of interpretation. We, we do not have a right to, to just make up rules on our own and, and, and figure, I'm going I'm to do it this particular way, the way I want to, Mike's way of studying Scripture. So how do you get them? One way is to study how the New Testament and the Old Testament relate. Another way, since the Bible is written in human language, is to study the actual laws of human language. Imagine someone saying, you know, my friend, he strikes out at everything he does. And some people will have absolutely no idea what that sentence means. Others will think he is discussing a, a baseball game. But if, if the context of that sentence was put in a situation where he was talking about everything, every business venture that his friend goes into fails, then you will understand he's not making a statement about striking out. He's not talking about athletics. He is using a figure of speech to describe vividly a man who is in a troubled situation. We know the meaning by the rest of what is actually being said. That is a law of language, and it's called context. And it is imperative that we understand there's nothing more important as you study Scripture than context. The Holy Spirit has inspired the writing of the Bible in human language. Therefore, that language is to be understood by the laws of language, especially as they are revealed to us in the Bible itself. So, um, this fourth section, I want to talk to you about the point of departure, because every activity has a, a starting point. And in the Bible, we start with our convictions about the Bible, and about the proper approach to how it is that we're going to study the Bible. Some people would say that, that a person should come to the Bible with just an open mind, with, with no convictions about whether or not it is God's Word, or whether or not it's even true. We should, according to them, study the Bible to see what the Bible itself proves itself to be. If it is God's Word, then it will show itself to be God's Word. That is a possible way to study the Bible. But that is not what I'm going to posit for a Christ follower to have a deepening of your commitment to knowing and understanding God's word and God's will for your life. So I want to list out for you our basic convictions about the Bible. And the first one is this. The Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, is God's word, period. It is inspired by God, and it is different from any other book you will read. Simply, what the Bible says, God says. 
To understand your Bible, you must be confident that it is God's word through which he has spoken to humans, including you. You must affirm that the Bible statements are authoritative and trustworthy and that you can depend upon them. We need to be careful. God may not say what someone thinks the Bible says. Many people have silly or wild ideas. Just because we believe the Bible does not mean that all our ideas are necessarily correct or that our understanding of a particular verse is right. That is one of the main reasons we need to interpret very, very carefully. Secondly, the Bible can be adequately understood in translations. Some Christians believe that only by studying the Bible in Hebrew or Greek can we get the meaning adequately, but that is not the case, nor has it ever been the case since shortly after the first century. Almost all Christians have known the Word of God via translations. Translations do convey the essential meaning of the Bible. Not all translations have been made carefully, however, and some have been made by those who do not have full confidence in the inspiration of the Scriptures. So we need to know which translations are very helpful and which ones are not so helpful. Third conviction. The Bible is a unity. The Old and New Testament do not contradict each other. Rather, the two are very complementary. The old prepares for the new, and the new fulfills the old. There is progress in the revelation. The Old Testament is partial and given in many various ways, as it is said. And the final revelation recorded in the New Testament is through Christ. Christ, however, is the center of the Old Testament, though his portrait there is just in parts and in pieces. We can only understand the Bible if we see in the whole of it Jesus Christ and God's plan for redemption through Jesus. And final uh, principle or, or fourth, not final, but the fourth principle I want you to get is that the Bible is its own interpreter. One passage actually throws light on another passage. Comparing Scripture with Scripture is basic in biblical interpretation. Plain statements help explain obscure statements. Literal statements illumine figurative statements. New Testament history and teaching unveil Old Testament prophecy. Such comparing is to be done carefully, not arbitrarily. For example, Luke 14, verse 33 says, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. And compare that with Luke 18, verse 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now say that a man reads this, and he decides that he needs to get rid of everything he has, all of his possessions, despite the fact that he has a wife and children. Having done this, he can no longer take care of his family now, and he has to depend on the charity of other people to actually survive. He made a superficial comparison of Scripture with Scripture, but had he studied all of God's Word, he would have also read in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, that on the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Also, 1 Timothy 5, 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, listen to these words, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And then out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. 
That's comparing Scripture with Scripture. Fifth principle, the Bible language is mainly normal human language. The New, Te New Testament was written in Koine Greek is the proper term. That was the normal street language of the day in the first century. The language was affected by the culture. The Koine Greek was affected by the culture, especially of the Jewish people of that time. So the New Testament contains many expressions to the Jews, Hebrew idioms, and we'll talk about those more. And there are words that had a common meaning, but in the Bible, they actually were given a special meaning. An example of that, ecclesia, which is translated church. Or the word agapao, which is translated to love, for example. Prophetic language has special characteristics, such as speaking of a future event in the past tense, even though it hasn't happened. In the main, though, the Bible writers used ordinary language, nouns, verbs, and so forth. Sixth, our understanding of the Bible must be accompanied by an honest, intelligent, and obedient response to its message. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. No understanding of the Bible is simply technical facts or, or theoretical knowledge. When, when a truth is clear in your mind, your will has to respond. Knowledge and obedience, they can't be separated. We learn in order that we may do. And we have not truly learned until we do. Seventh, the Holy Spirit's teaching is necessary for understanding the Bible. The truths of the Bible go beyond facts and beyond the information that you, you, you find in Scripture. Look at John 16, 13 again. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. 1 Corinthians 2, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The basic meaning of the Bible is spiritual, and to get that meaning, we need to be submissive to, we need to be taught by the Holy Spirit. So let's get down to the nitty gritty then, and to the nuts and bolts. Let's start talking about using the right tools. And, and, let, me, and let me say this, because there is a danger in, in using reference books the wrong way, particularly um, when you begin to study uh, through reference books for personal study. That's like eating pre-chewed or pre-digested food. No, no doubt you're going to get some benefit from that, but the benefit to the body of doing our own chewing and enjoying our own tasting, there's nothing greater than that. So no blessing and joy can surpass what we get from studying the Bible and learning directly from the Lord Himself. But I want to talk to you about the basic tools that you should have in your library. And these first few things that I'm going to talk to you about, everybody should have. We'll start off with this one, and that is a basic study Bible. Get a study Bible. Um, and uh, there, there's a study Bible in every different translation. Whatever your translation preference is, there's going to be a study Bible in it. So go to the bookstore and make sure that you purchase a, a study Bible. Um, get a, a Bible that has a lot of marginal cross-references in in that, my, my choice, as you can see up here, is the NIV Study Bible. I've been using that for years and years and years. And uh, don't be afraid to highlight. Don't be afraid to underline. Don't be afraid to write notes in the margin. Um, I think that's a, that's a very healthy thing to do. Um, and I would say this, secondly, and this is a really uh, important thing to do as you study Scripture, use other translations for comparison. So if you, like my main go-to is the NIV, the New International Version. 
but I always compare a verse or a passage that I'm reading with other translations. So I'll read the New Living Translation. I'll read the Holman Christian Standard Bible. I'll read the English Standard Version. I'll read the Message. I'll read all kinds of different passages, even, even King James, all of them to compare what I'm studying with what it is that I'm reading um, so that I get a, a, a diversity um, in what I'm doing. A great tool, by the way, for that is version. If you have uh, the Uversion app on your phone, on your, on your uh, iPad, on your computer, go to uversion.com. Um, that's a great way to really quickly cross-reference translations as you're reading or studying a particular passage of Scripture. And ask yourself, as you're looking at these different versions of a passage, why did this particular translation choose that word choice? Ask yourself those questions. Um, ask Ask yourself as you're reading it, which version do you prefer? You'll notice when I'm preaching, sometimes I'll be quoting a lot from the NIV. Sometimes every sermon that I have, the, the whole sermon, all the scripture references will be the NIV. But every once in a while you might see the NLT or the ESV. That's because I really liked how they rendered that particular verse. And that's why I've chosen to have that up there for you to see that. Um, another good thing for you to have um, is a, a dictionary. Just a normal dictionary, nothing special, Webster's, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, wh who else makes dictionaries other than Webster? New American? I don't know. Um, so get a dictionary. Get yourself a dictionary. Everybody knows their mother tongue, but you don't know it perfectly. Um, and a dictionary helps, I think, in several different ways. It, it enables us to understand clearly and precisely the meaning of words that we are acquainted with, but we just really can't define them. It suggests meanings to words that we don't know, and often it corrects us when we think we know the meaning of a word, but we actually didn't. So that's good. And the other thing that you need to have is this, a notepad, a notebook, a legal pad, whatever. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. But those are some basic tools that you, you need to have because if you don't write things down, your study can never be what it really should be. First, when you take notes, you actually see more. Second, you remember more. Sometimes writing may seem like it's a tedious and tiring thing to do, but don't give way to just being lazy. Note facts, like repeated words. Special or unusual things, people, places. Even if a fact seems unimportant, write it down. You, you may see the significance of that fact that you wrote actually later as you study. Note references to other passages. You may recall another verse that seems to connect with what it is that you're reading. Note any questions that come to your mind. Don't stop and try to answer all the questions. Just record your questions. Note any of your personal thoughts and interpretations on what it is that you happen to be studying. So let's get into some other tools. And these are, again, these are still probably along the lines of basic tools, but these are tools that you should have in your library. One is a, uh, where is that? Where are we at here? Here we go. Sorry, that wasn't following, I wasn't following along there. One is a concordance. Um, and uh, concordances are incredibly helpful. I have a New American Standard Concordance. I have the NIV Concordance. This one is the old standby, the Strong's exhaustive concordance. Um, now, uh, most Bibles actually have a concordance in the back, but they're, they're abridged. They're not complete. Um, and so to get yourself a concordance, you want to get an abridged concordance, I mean an unabridged concordance, one that is, is exhaustive like this one is. So every single word in the Bible is in this. Every single word, and that's what you want. Now, this I'm going to take you back to Uversion. Uversion is really helpful because it has built-in concordances right electronically right into it, and you don't have to have a book to look it up. You can type in a word and see that word, how it's used in whatever translation it is that you happen to be studying, and so that's a very helpful thing to do, and it makes it a lot easier, by the way. Um, but another tool that you should have handy uh, for yourself is a Bible dictionary. A Bible dictionary lists and explains uh, words and subjects that are actually found in the Bible, and it summarizes the biblical meanings, but it does not necessarily give a lot of Bible refer biblical references. For example, it will tell you how many people in the Bible were named John and who they were. 
So that's, that's why it's helpful to have a, a thing like a Bible dictionary, another good tool to have in your arsenal, your toolbox, is a Bible background commentary. So uh, Bible background commentary will give uh, historical and cultural background to a particular Bible passage that you're studying. This is, uh, this is one for the New Testament only. So uh, the, this one is, by the way, the one that I would recommend on either one of those. There are different uh, Bible background commentaries that exist, but I believe that IVP's Bible background commentary on the Old Testament and the New Testament are by far the most superior Bible background commentaries you could possibly buy. Um, and then the final uh, tool that I would ha have you uh, want to get, that is a particular commentary. Now, I don't recommend any particular commentary just on whatever book you are studying I would say get a commentary get more than one commentary um, I this is for the book of Luke and uh, I m some people go and they'll buy a commentary set so like this is the new American commentary and they have a whole set for all of the New Testament I don't I don't own uh, all the new American commentaries. What I look for, by the way, is authors of commentaries. And so some of you aren't you know, gonna know who writes good commentaries, who doesn't. I'll throw out a couple names, by the way. John R. W. Stott, a great commentator, uh, especially for preachers, the way that he commentates. He always writes it sermonically. Um, and uh, another one is F.F. F. Bruce, who does commentary. And, and his, his, um, his approach to writing commentary on scripture is very historical. So everything he does has a historical background. But see, whatever particular book you are studying, if you buy a, a commentary or two um, on that particular book, so like on the, you're studying out of Luke, and you buy a commentary or two on the book of Luke, um, that commentary is going to give you, the, they're going to give the author's opinion about the meaning of the actual text of Scripture that you are studying. They're going to do it book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Some are very thorough, like this is one book of the New Testament, the book of Luke. Look at how thick that is. The book of Luke in your New Testament is not that big. Um, and so, you know, some will give you a lot of detail, some are very brief. All of these tools are simply there to help you to aid you the student in becoming fully equipped at handling God's Word just as a screwdriver a hammer aid a carpenter in a particular project they do not make the project come to fruition they just aid the, the worker in his task so use these tools in the same manner next week I want to talk to you about uh, some general principles uh, as we go through uh, learning how to interpret Scripture. The third week, we're going to talk about some very special, specific principles that will guide you in the process as well.